Hey everybody, welcome into Eminem and M across the board. Eric McDowell, Ashley Miller, not Sean Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Special guest does not have an M for his last name. Wow. Technically, I probably don't either. But my favorite person is joining us. My handsome husband and the super talented Chris Honorado. What's up? Oh, boy, that's an introduction. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is fun, guys. You know, it's about time I get an invitation to this show. Well, well you know. Chris, you have more hair combined than two of the M's, by the way. <laughs> and I tried to get an M&M &M from Sarah, Ashley, but couldn't do it. Mm. So, mm. yeah, bring in the hair game. You got mm -hmm. some good hair. Uh, yeah, Sean's taking a much deserved vacation. The kids are off this week, so he's doing daddy daycare and hanging out with the kiddos, which we love too. Good family time. Chris and I got away. He deserves it as well. We're going to go all over the place. Normally, we do like three big topics here. We're not going to do that. We're, there has been so much that's happened that has been kind of water cooler stuff. So we're going to do baseball or the lack thereof, Jawan Howard, Aaron Rodgers. We're going to play a fun game with Eric's numbers, which we do once a month, the number 25, which <laughs> immediately one name comes to mind. That's going to make this uh, pretty fun. And we'll do our whiteboard as well. But Eric, you want to kick off baseball? Sure. Well, I do want to say... Uh... Chris is doing a fabulous job at WNYT in the morning show, so we congratulate you for that. And Thanks, Eric. of course, the uh, Honorado and Bagnati podcast, which is just tremendous. So thank you for your time. I would have worn this last week for the Olympics, but we had a guest from the Sharks. So I wear it in tribute for both of you this week with oh. an NBC. I love to do that. I like it. I like it, man. Yeah. All cool. right. We're going to touch on a sport that we remember that we hope to oh. see again. And that's called baseball. <laughs> Couple notes. I, I just can't fathom these these figures. I get it; they're entertainers. But the league proposes six forty thousand, six hundred forty thousand minimum for twenty two. Mm -hmm. That's an increase of about ten for four years. Sixty nine five raise from the current minimum. They don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it represents a bigger raise than the sixty three that they got over a five year window from sixteen to twenty one. Now, MLB has said that the February 28th deadline is a must. It is a deadline. The spokesman said after February 28th, games will be canceled. Threatening. Missed games are missed games, and salary will not be paid for those games. And I think people forget that they don't get paid till the regular season starts. The guys are not getting a dime when they play in the spring. So players are saying just lift the lockout. Owner said, no, we don't trust you because if we lift it, you promise you won't strike. So to you two, I think I look at this as a long at bat. Both of them are just fouling off pitches, getting nowhere. I like the fact that the owners in that in the league did go to Florida as a courtesy to have some of the players who are working out. I thought that was a great touch. But the quote that I, uh, I really find ironic is from Rob Manfred, where he said, I call missing games disastrous to the industry we know baseball ratings are going down and i think so do we find this would be disastrous it's got to stop yeah and i don't i mean it doesn't sound like they're really close like you mentioned the six hundred and forty thousand dollar number they want seven hundred and seventy five thousand. that's a <laughs> that's a big gap that's not a little gap that's not like a oh here's 10 grand more now we're close we're talking a hundred plus thousand dollars so it doesn't feel like it's all that close, but they're far away on a whole bunch of other things too. They're talking about revenue sharing, service time, manipulation, the draft. Like there's a, a whole bunch of things that they don't feel like they're all that close on. Yeah, guys, for me, I think the biggest sticking point um, is not the minimum salary. While the gap is large, I think that one is is something that could be solved quickly enough to get these guys um on time for opening day uh, it's it's the arbitration service time uh that is yeah. the biggest issue baseball's at 22 percent right now in the old cba uh the players union wants it at 80 percent. basically what they're saying is you know we want 80 percent of the players who have been in the league for two years to be arb eligible so they're not strung out on this rookie mm -hmm. contract for six seven years before one they can be arbitration eligible and then even hit free agency after that uh you look at a guy like aaron judge who has you know everybody remembers him with the yankees here for more than a handful of years and and he won't hit free agency until after this year like in no other sport mm -hmm. does does that exist um and and baseball has said that 
even if we wanted to move above the 22% and give you guys 50%, right? Like, let's say we'll meet you halfway mm -hmm. um, and 50% of guys after two years of service time can reach our arbitration baseball saying we don't have the support among ownership that, that we can even go above 22. So that to me, that chasm of what the players union wants and what baseball is saying it can do uh, that I think it's the arbitration that that players have the the hardest time with here is I'm under a rookie contract, if you will, for so long. I'm 29 years old, 30 years old in a lot of cases before I hit free agency. Yeah. And we've seen each and every winter, guys, where baseball is devaluing players who are 30 or older. So mm -hmm. now I'm playing on, on a, almost a minimum salary contract for basically my entire career, you're telling me not cool. And so I'm, I'm siding with the players yeah. on this one. I, I think they should be eligible to hit free agency much sooner than they currently are. Yeah. Well, and they, I think they dropped that number to 75, but like you talk yes. about 80 to 75 versus 22, like still the word and listen, baseball has money. So at the end of the day, the money you're right is probably less of an issue than these contracts, but like these numbers are very far apart. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the thing that I found interesting, too, is that they did approve the DH. So for the owners, they can come back and say, now that the NL has a DH, that's another big salary and a big hitter on the roster that makes up for a 210 hitter or that's really a pitcher. That's one thing they could throw. But I agree with the players, too, Chris, about the tanking. Not a fan of that. You know, we've seen it. It worked with Houston uh, throwing out what they did illegally. But teams now, you know, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, we've talked in the past about this long traditional franchises that are just tanking it and that's got to stop and the players agree with that but i am pleased about the new dh try to get the same rules in play uh, i'm really siding with the players on all this and i don't want to hear the owners cry uh poverty because they need as for manfred i know everybody will rip manfred and i'm not a fan of him at all but the fact is again the commissioner reports to the owners Right. So no matter what he may believe or may want to do, he has to be considered, I guess, the puppet of the owners. That's who he represents, and the players will always have a problem with that. Yeah, I, I think, the, right, the DH was was the foregone conclusion in a lot of this, and I think expanded playoffs is too. Um, they look at the, the contracts that, like, TBS laid out to get postseason baseball, the money that TBS uh, spent – the league wants more teams in the playoffs, right? It creates more interest in the month of September. Fans are going to go to games. It, it, the teams are, you know, are fighting for the third wild card or whatever the heck it is. Um, and and players too, right? You, you you reach the playoffs. Now you've got roster contract bonuses. There are playoff bonuses in play. Every everybody stands to win if we can get through some of these hurdles. That that honestly, a month ago, two months ago, I thought. This is not a big deal. Right. But now that we're, you know, when when does this pod go up? Sometime later today, we're, we're you know, 72 hours, 96 hours away from this hard deadline, Eric, mm -hmm. that you spoke about at the beginning of the show. And, and now I'm more confident that we will miss games than I was two months ago when I thought they will iron this thing out. I, I'm, I'm, I would say to you now, I'd get on my Caesars app now and bet <laughs> good money that we will miss regular season games. And if you're talking about missing regular season games, well, now an expanded playoff is in jeopardy. You know what I mean? Like, they're not going to give you an expanded playoff at a time when you may have to cut regular season games. That might be the first thing to go as they try to cram whatever. And they've said they're not going to make up games. They're not going to do double headers. They're not right. going to add extra regular season games. Wherever you start is what you're going to get. And they want a four-week spring training because they're keeping the health and safety of players in mind. Like, you got to let these guys go and play for four weeks. I don't know if I believe that. They're probably ready to play baseball whenever. But if that's what they want, then you're not pushing it forward much more. So, the, I, I think when the DH came in, it was funny because all the teams signed just veteran older guys. And, and you know, they didn't know what to expect from the position. The Red Sox signed Orlando Cepeda, who was about 58 years old, couldn't hit a curveball. You know, on the Yankees signed Bloomberg, who, you know, needed a job as well. Uh, I think players like J.D. Martinez are licking the chops, and guys who are DHs now will suddenly have a great opportunity. But uh, 
I'm worried about the future of the sport. Those of us that have had fantasy leagues, we love it. We have so much fun. It was the first fantasy league before football and other sports. And baseball's just ingrained. If if you look in here, you two, you could count 20 baseballs. Some of them autographs, some of them from special games. It's ingrained in our hearts, but I think it is, as I said to Ashley prior to the show beginning, it's an older sport. It's slow. And we bring our 10-year-old daughter with it to a game. If it was uh, Mark Burley against Bob Gibson, we'd be done in an hour and 20 minutes. But it's not. <laughs> There's pitching changes, stepping out two hours, 45 minutes. They're losing the youth, and they lose the youth in the playoffs as well when they start at 8.40 p.m. So I agree with Manfred's quote. It would be disastrous. They've got to sit down, him and Clark, and get this damn thing done because you are both in roles of that are not just saving the sport, but put that first somehow. And, and to turn down an arbitrator... Chris, I mean, really, the player's turning down an arbitrator. That's the person that comes in and fixes things. They don't even trust a federal arbiter to come in, really? Yeah, and I, I, listen, I think as ownership, too, you have to understand, you talked about losing the youth. The youth of this game is what brings in money. Like, you've got guys who are, once you hit 30, you're old. Other than, like, <laughs> Mike Trout, these guys aren't playing – like superstars into their early and mid thirties. It's guys like Fernando Tatis Jr. It's guys, it's those guys who you want to make big money because they are selling jerseys. It's, it's Otani. It's, it's guys who are super young, who are still at, they're going to play the best of their whole career in those times. Okay. So then pay them when they're playing well, pay them, I reward them for what they're doing, not the other way around. Don't make them like, you know what I mean? With these contracts where you're not hitting and making real money until you're, you've been in for X number of years when you've contributed otherwise. And, and to be fair, like <clears throat> some teams are, are, are getting it right and, and, and being smart about it. Yeah. Right. Like, no. um, you know, there are young players who, who have gotten monster yes. contracts yep. in baseball where you'd say, boy, he's only 21 or 22. You don't have to sign him yet. But but teams but are rewarding be. their superstars. Yeah. You know, it it's right. it, 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 it 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 goes with any business. Right. There is value in keeping your most important. I hate to say it. Employees happy. Mm -hmm. uh, you want you want to keep all your employees happy. That that would be ideal. But the but the most important ones, like they just get special treatment. That's the way it goes. And it upsets us on many levels. I know that, but, but you have to keep some of those people happy. And so teams have started to do that. I mean, look, it also ends up, I think, benefiting teams in the long run. Atlanta threw money at Acuna and Albies early on in their careers. And it was still the industry looked at it and was like, boy, those guys didn't get as much as they should have, but it's beneficial to the Braves as much as it is to Acuna, who at 21 is going to get a hundred million dollars, yeah. you know, and, and it's, and that's a, a very club friendly deal that mm -hmm. the Braves have worked out. Now they're screwing everything up with Freeman. That's a whole nother thing, but, um, <laughs> but the young players like a Tatis, right. Yeah. Um, like a Vlad Guerrero jr. Those young guys, some of them are getting early contracts, which is, which is good to see. Yeah. And, and I think also like with those guys, you can't keep them off the field, which is why it, but it's when you get in those situations where they were like dropping guys back down wow. because they didn't want it to hit. I, I mean, we're sort of past that for the guys who are going to be, listen, game changers and lineup changers for them, which is good. But still, the service time, you're going to – then you're hurting, obviously, not your star players, but maybe your second tier of young players who don't want to spend their whole lives in the minor leagues before they, you know, spend seven years in the minors before they get up to the majors. And here they are with the clouds forming again. And last year with the All-Star Game, Shohei Otani is the sun shining on the sport of baseball, okay, for what he is doing. Young kids are attracted to him. Fabulous personality. I mean, kids are drawn to him, also drawn to him. What he's doing, comparing to Ruth, I like to hear that because you're bringing back the past of baseball, the tradition, mm -hmm. talking about that because kids may not know who Babe Ruth was. Now they do because of Shohei Otani. So here is the sun shining, the all-star game. What he did was fabulous, and then these clouds are covering it up. They have players that they can market. As you folks have mentioned, different players, that it was always Trout, and the thought was, well, Trout's with the Angels, they don't win. Well, the Angels still aren't winning, but they have Otani and they have players like Tati that have the personality that kids are drawn to. 
and take away those clouds because baseball, you need that right now. You need Otani and you need the young stars, and that's where the focus must be. Well, and you wanted to mention, I mean, you talk about the dark clouds over that organization in particular. I know you you feel strongly uh, so about well. that situation if you want to kind of wrap it up with that and just – and that, listen, that's got a, a lot of branches that come along with it. There's some far reaching roots there that have gone far beyond the angels even. Well, very good segue, Ashley. Um, this is extremely difficult to touch on, but as a public relations person who worked in pro and college sports, we have relationships with the players, with the coaches, you travel with the teams, you get close to people, but never in my career have I ever heard anything as abhorrent as a PR person dealing drugs to a major league pitcher on the road, and he was a distributor. And it just blows me away. I know people won't look at the profession and say anything about the profession. It just happens to be that that's the role he's yeah. in. But we are trustworthy people who work extremely hard to serve people like you in the media. You get close to the players. They are family to you. And for that individual, and I won't mention Mr. K's first name, I'm just going to say he got exactly what he deserved. That organization, unfortunately, has had so many things happen over the years. Yeah. Pitchers who died, outfielder who had an accident. It's just this, to me, is just abhorrent. And I'm pleased that the punishment was laid down. And I'm just disgusted that a person who is there to serve the players, coaches, the media, PR people are extremely dedicated and they are extremely hardworking. And as I know from being there, I love working with the media, love students, pro athletes, all of that stuff. This really hit home and I'm pleased that the punishment was laid down uh, for what that individual deserved. And he is an embarrassment to the profession. Yeah, Chris and I say all the time, we think we work hard. Uh, there is nobody in the in the business who works harder than a sports PR, communications, a college, SID. You people are, are the hardest working and, and you travel. That's the difference, too, is like we don't have to travel. We don't have to leave home. We stay in this market. You guys have to travel, cover multiple teams. Um, but you're right. It is. Listen, whenever you're affiliated with the team, your part of your job is taking care of the players. But regardless of what age they are, you are, you're representing the organization. You want things to look good. And, and he is the exception to the rule. He, he, you know, he, there, <laughs> this is not commonplace. Um, no. But yeah, what he did was de destroy parts of the organization, you know, led to the death of players like this is, I mean, it's an extreme circumstance I know, but certainly we wouldn't lump him in with anyone like you or anyone else we know, because we know the good work that you guys do. But there's there's accountability that falls on mm -hmm. the players oh. here too, right? Yeah, I no, mean, yeah. yeah. It takes two to tango. I I will never believe that like something happens in a professional sports locker room that isn't widely known mm -hmm. and therefore accepted when it's passed on. Like I know we've talked about obviously Tyler Skaggs and, and Matt Harvey here, right? Mm -hmm. Are the two names that everybody's been talking about. But where are the other guys? Mm -hmm. Like steroids didn't just happen behind closed doors and nobody knew about it drug abuse was happening within this organization. And I, I can't believe that it wasn't widely known that like there was a problem. And so where was that? Just one person who was going to be willing to stick up or say something um, knowing that this was going on. I just can't believe that, that people, people didn't know about it and couldn't have said something sooner. And that's really probably what, what bugs me more than anything is you've got the one individual yeah, who who kind of ruined the whole thing, but you've got a, a larger collection of people who just didn't do anything or didn't do right. enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe they did something, but it wasn't enough. And that that's kind of troubling that uh, what was going on within that organization and maybe that clubhouse, nobody was really willing to stick their neck out. And and that's sad. Yeah. And I, and not and I don't think you're referring to like Skaggs himself. Listen, these are individuals who clearly now have some sort of substance abuse issues and are being taken advantage of. But you hope that the others in the locker room who maybe aren't even a part of it, don't want any part of it, whatever, were man enough or woman enough to kind of stick their neck out and say like, listen, this is all going on. This isn't good for anyone, let alone the well-being of X, Y, Z players, however many players it was. Um, but yeah, it, it should have been the responsibility of even those people who weren't involved 
to get involved or to say something. You always say, see something, say something. But you're right. My guess is more than this many people knew of what was going on in that locker room, which means that those people now have to live with that the rest of their lives, knowing they contribute in, in whichever ways they did to what the end result was. And, and professional athletes, they I remember one that said, look, you don't understand. You're not a professional athlete. This is our career. This is our livelihood. I don't know anything else I could do. So I'm going to do everything I can to try to, to be the best. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, they, they try to find ways to do that. But Chris, I'll say this about what you're saying is that there is retaliation that happens in professional and college mm -hmm. sports. Unfortunately, people, trainers, equipment people, the behind the scenes people, PR, they may be aware of something and they fear that they may get retaliated for bringing it up. I obviously was not in that case, but I've seen that happen to some colleagues where they just have nowhere to turn, nowhere to turn. And uh, no way are we defending what occurred, but it's possible that the person may have, somebody else may have said, hey, this is going on and was told, keep it quiet. Well, guess what, folks? You can't keep it quiet anymore. Not in this society. And that's a good thing. There's too many ways that things can get leaked to the press and things can come out. So I think retaliation is something that's very unfortunate. And it puts people in the behind the scene roles where if they can't trust their boss and other front office, then they need to get out of that organization. And I, I hear all that. And if it's if it's up to the 25th guy on the roster who is a bench guy and he's maybe yep. a utility player who plays, you know, 20 games a season, he doesn't say something. I almost don't. Put, but but there is maybe the biggest star in the sport on that roster. Right. A guy who could say right. anything and do anything, and right. nobody would even think about retaliation, right? Yeah. And I'm not—I don't—I hate yeah. to put it on one guy, but if yeah. he knew, and we know who we're talking about here, if he knew, and that's the one guy who can say something. So, yes, yeah, there's always somebody who who is uh, who is like above mm -hmm. everybody else, right? Even yep. the manager. The I mean, mm -hmm. look at the way we've seen coaches yep. and managers fired simply to keep players happy. They're I hear you. I hear you, E. And, uh, you know, it, it just strikes me that there's at least somebody on every roster who's right. above any Correct. possible retaliation. That's right. Yeah. You have and to have even, that relationship and trust, but you're yeah. exactly right. And listen, if they were dumb enough to take it out on the person that we're talking about, that guy'd have a job tomorrow on any team in the league. Right. They'd pay him $200 million to, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, there is certainly a lot of culpability to go around, but it's unfortunate. Eric, you always talk about if you get ahead of the story, you can control it. It took Tyler Skaggs dying for anyone to know about this. Like it took one of their players dying for them to be like, uh oh, now we got to figure out and and then it all unravels. But it didn't have to be that way. And that person was giving him things that could lead to that occurring. Oof. And I don't care how afraid you are retaliating nothing nothing can compare to that you have yeah. an obligation to that person and his family to do something about it mm -hmm. and now that person can rot in prison and think what he should have done well yeah. should have and could have are very different things yeah and it, and that's even like a back channel like say you didn't feel comfortable going to someone in the organization call his parents yeah. Call his parents and say like, hey, this is going on. You got to get your boy some help, whether it's getting them at like, you know what I mean? I, there's ways to go about it and be like, don't use yeah. my name. And, and who knows if it comes back on you. But there are ways to do it if you're not comfortable going up the ladder in your own organization. So either way. Um, wow. What a transition that is. <laughs> got to read a sponsor now. <laughs> go from the low of the lows to, uh, to, you know, a little bit of a high here. Uh, we're going to move on in just a sec, but. New year, new goals at Mohawk Honda. It's a new year with new goals. Start your new uh, year right behind the wheel of a new or pre-owned vehicle that fits your budget and your new year's resolutions. Stop into Mohawk Honda. Check out our broad selection of pre-owned inventory. We're here to find the right make, model, and price point, which is important to fit your budget. Our goal is to help you meet your goals. Let Luis, the VIP man, Morales, Jake, Hot Sauce. Hot sauce. Eric, go ahead. Hot Sauce, Doyle. <laughs> Cars with Kern Swoboda or Mark from Clifton Park Ellis Jr. Connect you up with a perfect deal. We do that every time, Chris. We both do the hot sauce thing. It's a shit. Uh, <laughs> right now is the perfect time to get top dollar for your trade-in with the Kelly Blue Book instant cash offer. Same day, check in your hand. The day you trade in your vehicle, just ask for Brian, buy with BMAC, McKenna, Mike Benice, Nicole Oser, or Cam. Let's do a deal, McKenna. Again, all our sales and leasing consultants will make 
your New Year's automotive goals, their top priority. Start the new year right with just the right deal at Mohawk Honda in Glenville, where they go out of their way to please you. Always. To please you. All the time. All right. Next up, Mr. Jawan Howard and the, the fracas that was college hoops. Our guy, Andrew Catalan, was on the call. He's had one heck of a week. Yes. Our News Channel 13 colleague was on the call for Michigan, Wisconsin, which turned into, uh, you know, a, a total crapshoot, basically. Jawan gets five games. Greg Gard gets fined $10,000. Jawan gets fined $40,000, I believe it was. Um, a couple of suspensions for three different players, two on the Michigan side, one on the Wisconsin side. Your initial thoughts on the, the uh, listen, Fab Five and timeouts, I just think it's funny. Everyone with the memes and still having trouble with timeouts from the Fab Five. Thoughts on the initial, you know, melee, we'll call it. It wasn't really a melee, but also suspensions. More or less, do you agree with them? I just am interested to know. Chris, go ahead. Wow. Okay. Um, I think it's right for Howard. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have gone more than the five games. I wouldn't suspend him into any postseason mm -hmm. format, uh, be it the Big Ten tournament or the NCAA tournament, if the Wolverines do, in fact, get there. Um I have an issue with suspending the players. This does not happen if not for the head coaches. And Greg Gard is is responsible here too. Um, he's an adult who did not handle it the way I would say it should have been handled. It looked, it, to me, it looked like Howard was ready to blow by him in the handshake line. And Gard puts his, Gard makes the first physical contact of the two guys. Not to excuse what Howard did, but guard grabs Howard. Th it That escalates the situation. I wouldn't have suspended the players at all because if I'm the conference, I would have looked at this and said, our adults failed the student athletes here. So I'm going to give them a pass for whatever role they had. And I know there were punches thrown, but I'm still willing to look past that based on what the coaches did. Um, you know, the Howard thing for me, here's, here's my issue. Um, <laughs> You know, look, I don't have a major problem with it because it's a great storyline. And, yeah. and I know people are going to be disgusted <laughs> at the actions of an adult and a coach and all this stuff. But I don't care. If this happened in the 80s in the Big East, we would be, oh, my God, look at this. Look at the passion, right? Look at the fire. Mm. It, it, this, this means so much to these guys. That's what we would have said 30, 40 years ago in a Big East rivalry. Now we got a Big Ten rivalry. And we're we're just looking down on the fact that there was some kind of physical altercation. Yeah, okay. but I think you look down on what it's about. Like it's about a freaking timeout. If it was about like the physicality and things getting chippy and it spilled over, fine. Like that's Big East style, whatever. It's about a timeout. Like, okay. But it but but if we go even deeper than that, it's about the fact that both teams have their reserves out there, that the backups yeah. playing. Right. If right. Howard has a problem with guard calling a timeout, you shouldn't be pressing full court. I agree. Th no. This is you're competing to the very end, and you haven't really waved the 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 white towel, white flag to the opposition. So I don't have a problem with what guard did. And Howard needs to look in the mirror and have somebody have yep. somebody say to him, dude, you were pressing full court. Down 15. This guy has every right to call timeout to reset that clock to get it across half court. So I'm both adults mm -hmm. I, I have a problem with here, although quietly I'm enjoying it. <laughs> oh, he's got the media hat on. Of course he does. <laughs> As you know, I've seen thousands of basketball games, and I get very frustrated when it's when a coach has – two fulls and a 30 left down by 15 with 119 to play unless you as i said on the previous show unless you play with matrix you're not going to tie the damn game okay i think what i like to see is when a coach will look at the other coach and do this and the refs calls a timeout right. nobody discusses all the kids mm -hmm. come in please don't call it garbage time okay yeah. Because your kid that is a freshman that works so hard gets to play in the NCAA tournament. We're going to see a lot of that with big leads. Get those kids in and keep playing. Uh, as for Howard, I know I agree with you both about this. I think it's a good suspension. Uh, most people I've seen have been fired or worse, okay? Mm -hmm. Some are fired because of an anonymous source or anonymous reports or accusations. 
Thank you, Andrew, because this is not anonymous. Everybody saw it happen. <laughs> he gets the five. But the punch could have gotten him fired because the handshakes after the game are meant for hospitality. But that punch, remember there was, a, I think, a coach in uh, Canada, one of the NHL team sites with a city, it might have been Calgary, was going to press charges because he physically had an altercation. So I'd really have to look at that again, that little slap, that reaction. Yeah. I but you're mean, both right about the players yeah. will react what to the coaches. <laughs> the players react to the coaches. And I did get tumbled over once by a fight that spilled over to the scorer's table, lost the coffee, lost the computer, printer broke. I was more angry about that than the guys fighting. <laughs> you're costing me money, man. Yes. And the media money. can't get their stats. Yeah. Listen, the biggest problem I have with Juwan Howard, it, you're – I don't want to hear then about you leading young men and you preaching like uh, that's what you're doing. And that's what, like, I just, I, I'm not going to buy it. The other thing I have a problem with is come out and say, you're sorry immediately. Give yourself an hour or two to cool off and come out and admit that you made a mistake and say, you're sorry. He didn't come out with an official apology until after he was already suspended for five games. And it was total BS. Like, that, to me, you might as well not even apologize for it. But if you're really sorry, then man up to it and do it pretty quickly. Don't let it sit and then be like, oh, well, I got suspended for five games. I better apologize and tell everyone how sorry I am for embarrassing my family and everything else. Like, that's the biggest thing I have a problem with. I don't have a problem with, like, the fire or the passion. If you're going to punch somebody, I would prefer you actually punch them and not, like, slap them. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, to me, it's just like you're a leader of men. That's what you're claiming to be. So be a man. Be the adult in the room. It, and if you want to walk by the guy, that's fine. I, I, you know, whatever. Um, it was wrong of guard to put his hands on him because you people immediately. Uh, what is it? What do you always hear? Like, don't touch me. Don't put your hands on me. Don't you hear that at all? Levels? You used to Even be in, that like, way. You'd be basketball. like this. Yep. And that was okay. Yeah. Even if in a high school basketball game, like if somebody, they as soon as you put your hands on somebody, there's like a switch that goes off in people's minds that takes them to the next level. It kind of makes them see red. And so you putting your hands on him took him to another level. Didn't need to swing, didn't need to slap, whatever. But also just apologize for it. Why apologize Why it. can't basketball players punch? Like, I it, don't know. It, remember that <laughs> brawl between the Heat and the Knicks? It's all open hand. Like, can't we yeah. get some closed fists? I mean, yeah. Eric, even in your experience – Latrell Sprewell went with open hands. I mean, he tried to he tried to clamp them together, but he even went with open hands. Spree he did. also had long nails, and he basically left. Uh, it was hard to cover up four scratches on the neck. Yeah, yeah, I that don't know. I, PJ, I'm not sure. Guy. Maybe they don't have a lot of boxing experience, but you would think like even I know how to punch. Well, it, the funniest fight is to watch football guys. You can't hurt anybody, but your hand or face mask. You know, you I, look. It's like, what are you going to punch that's going to hurt anybody? I can't. always think like even hockey guys. What are you insane? You take your gloves off and then you swing at a bunch of helmets. The NLL guys have it right. I do lacrosse on the weekends. They take their helmets and their gloves off. They throw it all off and then they start swinging. Smart. You don't want to break your hands. Let's be fair about the criticism here. A baseball brawl is pretty pathetic too. Oh, baseball, yeah. baseball players, baseball players are better at punching water coolers yeah. and walls than they are other yep. people. It's bizarre. Yeah, and they, and they just throw things like throw your glove, throw your helmet. Get it, come on. Unless you're Nolan Ryan, I yes. wouldn't take him on. No, yeah. right, Ventura got that one. Yeah. Ashley, you wanted apologies, and I agree with you, and we've got two that we want to throw in there. Uh, Phil Mickelson. He's talking to Alan Shipnick, a famous lawyer, and he says, off the record, but seriously, again, what he said about Saudi, I'm just going to say the word scary, that enough was bad. Yeah. Uh, but what he said, uh, you know, basically saying they're evil, they're this and that, but we should have the PGA Tour go there. Well, that now you're over for 2. All right. Okay? You didn't put one foot in the mouth. Both are in yeah, your mouth. Yeah, them okay? both in there. He did apologize. I get it. But that's going to be tough to come back from. Oh. Rory and others are going after him about it. And the other one is Alexander Vreyev is the pronunciation, mm. the tennis player who swung his racket repeatedly just below the feet of the judge, okay, repeatedly, goes back over again. The guy lifts his feet and has to get out of the chair. 
that made Ely Nastassi look like a priest, I'm telling you. And I saw that guy play, you know, in his heyday. But this was a disgrace. And and if you're John McEnroe, he'd say, boy, I never thought of that either. But it's not a funny situation. It's a yeah. dangerous situation. Emotions come into play. Next day, tremendous work where he, he po- apologized. They did the right thing in Mexico. You're out of the tournament. Double, single, mixed. Right. I don't care. You're done. Both of them can apologize. But still, it's like when you're in a court and you hear strike that. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult right. to hear strike that and really strike it in both of these cases. What do you think? Yeah, that's, first of all, the court situation is the worst thing ever. I, I've like heard it and I'm like, no, no, no. That You almost have to start over. Like you need a new crop of jurors because they've already heard it and now it's not going anywhere. You're right. Uh, so I agree. No, strike that. No, don't, no, no. Um, yeah, I, listen, Nadal came out and got after him about how inappropriate the behavior was. And when you get like some of the top players in the world, you know, criticizing you, you know, you've done something wrong. Um, and as for, you know what, sometimes I think, and currently in this day and age, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I think it's harder to come back from something you've said than something you've done, specifically mm-hmm. in the world of athletics. Um, at least in this instance, harder for Mickelson to come back from what he's now put out into the universe, because I don't think people will ever really believe you when you say like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Now, but you probably thought about it. And if you're thinking about it, then you probably believe it. And you said it. You're sorry you said it. I'm not sure you're sorry. You know, you're sorry it came out of your mouth. I'm not sure you're sorry you thought it in the first place. Um, so I think in the case of tennis, it's easier to come back from. You lost your temper. Uh, listen, it got a little crazy. But at the end of the day, you could still be like a decent human being and say, like, I lost my temper. You know, I'll do some anger management, whatever. I think it's harder to come back from something you said. That's that's a really interesting point. I, I wouldn't have thought it that way. Yeah, Zav- I mean, Zverev just lost his mind. Yeah. Um, and look, we you know, people don't talk about this uh, maybe because she isn't as relevant as she once was, but like Serena's outburst. That was wild. In that oh, U.S. Open yeah. final against Osaka. Like that's I get it. It's is it a handful of years ago now? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's four years ago. Yeah. Um, that was whoa alarming. Like, like we I'm gonna got shove some this ball issues. down your throat. Like that we, to me is what sets off the the sirens. Yeah, but and and you're right, Ash. We don't talk about that really as much now. The Mickelson thing, first of all, that was not an apology. I mean, Eric <laughs> is somebody who who is who deals with these types of that was not that couldn't have been a more pathetic yes non apology apology. It uh, was and, only to his sponsors that hadn't yanked him yet. Right. Right. And it was like, like he's the victim at the start of it. And then he's kind of sorry. It was, it it was pathetic. And so if you're going to screw up, screw up and then own it, get better by the the mistake or poor decision you've made. Um, and, and, and be sorry about it. Um, he was not, and he's in a position where he doesn't really need to be now. Look, he's not going to play. You know, you hear the commissioner's comments, Monahan's comments. Mickelson is not going to play in an event anytime soon. He may be out of Augusta simply because it isn't a real PGA Tour event. But anything that the PGA Tour is the governing body of, uh, I don't think you're going to see Phil Mickelson for quite a while. Right. Yeah. This whole the whole Saudi league has created. I mean, not just from him, just like a whole you know storm for the PGA and for golf and. Yeah. Ugh. Anywho, uh, hey, who's the Packers fan in the room? If he's below, I think it's him. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Uh, yeah. Is he going to play for the Packers next year? I, You're probably more confident that he's going to play for the Packers next year than you were that he was going to play for the Packers last offseason coming into this past season. No? Yeah, I mean, some of the relationship stuff has been cleaned up, which is yeah. encouraging that you've got adults yep. who can like sort through some stuff yes. in a mature <laughs> manner. Like, my goodness, oh, talk my about goodness. it, people, and let's move on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I know we're going to get into the cryptic Instagram post that Aaron Rodgers has told Pat McAfee, there's nothing there, don't, yep. don't decir- decipher anything. Um, I was, go back a week, my life is the, uh, seesaw of emotions in sports i thought baseball for sure they're going to get this thing done now i no. go back a week rogers ends his engagement with shailene woodley however they broke up they broke up and i thought to myself well now he's staying in green bay because he doesn't need to be closer to hollywood 
for his relationship. Then the Instagram post comes out, and I see this picture of Devontae Adams and Randall Cobb separated by a blank space that where Rodgers would be standing. That was at the Chiefs game, so obviously Aaron wasn't even on the sideline. But I'm looking at that picture, and I'm saying to myself, this is his message, that we are separating. I don't know that I'll play with you guys ever again. Thank you for the great season. Thank you for being great teammates and friends and, and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, well, it, one of two things. He's already decided that he wants out or he is putting pressure on this organization to Get one, either trade him, right? Or do something big in this off season to, to make us better. And they've got mm-hmm. cap issues that, are are difficult to deal with and and to become a better team because of their cap situation but i thought this is rogers playing a game of some sort obviously i just don't really know exactly what the game is did you buy his explanation of the picture to pat mcafee what did he say so it was basically like his instagram post was a a Monday night gratitude post. He was, yeah. he was expressing his gratitude for Shailene Woodley, for yep. all the people who had to deal with all the BS for the COVID situation that, yep. you know, he decided not to get vaccinated, but it, it turned on other people. It, it forced other people to have to deal with his crap. Um, and then also he was saying it was basically an appreciation post for like, they were part of that. Like I was missing from that game because of a decision that I made. And he said they, I guess they had sent him the picture after that game because he always, that's the spot he always stands in during the anthem with one on one side and one on the other. And he said they left a spot for him. And that meant a lot to him because he then understood how important he was and how much they missed him and that. Listen, he's going to say whatever you want to hear. It just felt like the type of post where, you're at the end of a road. And maybe it's maybe it was the relationship with Shailene Woodley that that made him do all of this. Maybe it maybe it had nothing to do with football at all. Maybe it was the ending of a of a of an intimate personal relationship that made him look at all the other relationships in his life. I great. I'd love to hear that because then I feel confident that he wants to stay with the Packers. Um I just Something with Rodgers, though, there's always something a little deeper than we think we see on the surface. You, you know, he lost me, Chris, when he broke up with Olivia Munn. I don't know what he was thinking there because she's awesome. Great actress. And But uh, I have a friend named Khan who's from Wisconsin and moved to this area. And uh, we had a, a very good discussion with it. And frankly, he was very upset and let down. He said, we finally have the offense going, the defense going, the top seed, MVP caliber. Now we have no special teams. So there's always one piece, one wheel that's loose with the Packers. I had them winning the thing this year. And you can't blame him because he was the MVP. But if anybody thinks he's going to retire, the last MVP to retire in the NFL, I believe, was almost 60 years ago. (laughs) So I think he'll bounce. I think he'll wind up in a Denver in something. He's going to do what Brady did and what Peyton did and all that. But you may agree with me with Khan on this, is that he's a little flustered and saying, you know, maybe it's time. Maybe we've had enough of him and he's had enough of us because right now the feeling is Khan and his family, the people that are up there are saying, you know, it, we got the title, but what is going on here? Why can't he focus? What's with the long hair? You can judge him for whatever, but there seems to be a time where maybe it's time. And would you agree with that? Because it seems as though some Packer fans are like saying, you know, we need a change and he needs a change. Thank you. Come back in five years with the plaque and your numbers on the wall. What do you think? I, I would, I would say I would like to, there was a lot of um, disruption in the relationship between Tom Brady and the Patriots, right? Yeah. Yes. Did they enjoy watching Brady win a Super Bowl with the Buccaneers when he probably should have been playing for them? I would never trade Aaron Rodgers. I would not be the GM who traded Aaron Rodgers, the greatest quarterback in that franchise's history. And oh, by the way, they had Bart Starr and Brett Favre. Exactly. And it isn't even close. Yep. Aaron Rodgers is light years better than both of those two guys. There is no way it would be on my resume that I traded Aaron Rodgers. That didn't work out for the guy before him, before Gutenkust, Ted Thompson, trading Brett Favre. Favre whipped them 
twice in one season wearing a Vikings uniform. I am not going to give him the opportunity to go <laughs> win somewhere else. No chance. And and I don't know that I would have felt as strongly about it as I do now if I didn't see Brady do it to the Patriots to win six Super Bowls for one franchise. And then the again, the, the two egos couldn't be separated enough to say, let's do this for the betterment of the franchise. Let's continue to win together. Yep. Brady had to go somewhere else, and he then he won again. There, there's just no I, – I say it all the time. Ask a Patriots fan for their absolute honest opinion. Would you have rather kept Brady having seen what he did? And they're all going to say, yeah. Which, yes. There you go. There you go. I just – it wouldn't be me. And I know – I understand the comparison is way too much of a leap because Brady has won more Super Bowls than any franchise – in history and Rogers only has one and he's only been there once, but he still gives you the absolute best chance to get back. And I would say to your yeah. friend, Khan, who's in Wisconsin, this was not a special teams issue. I, I'm so tired of hearing that from people that offense scored 10 points you at home in January to win a playoff game, scoring 10 points. You, right. you, you have to, you have to anticipate something going wrong. Now, two dramatically big things went wrong with a blocked field goal and a blocked punt that ended up being a touchdown. But I don't want to hear it that, oh, this was a special teams failure. It was not. This was an offensive failure by the number one offense in football on their home field with the top seed on a Saturday night against a team that was playing on a short week from California and had played a number of road games. I think they played like six of their last eight games are on the road. So th this falls, as much as I love them, it falls squarely on Rodgers the same way I think it did the year before against the Buccaneers. You give up a 50-yard touchdown pass at the end of the half where Kevin King gets burned by Scotty Miller, and, and Brady has all the momentum going in to halftime, but still, you're the, you, you are arguably the best quarterback in the game. You have to find a way to win that game. And that's my biggest issue with, with Aaron has always been. It just doesn't feel like he elevates at the right moments. The regular that's... season and the body of work is great. But in those, those key moments, and even if it's the course of a that's full right. game, it doesn't feel like he raises the level of play enough to win. That's my rant. That's where they're coming from. I was going to say, we yep. got him fired up, Eric. He yes, is you betcha. fired up. That red hair showing it off. It's uh, yeah, no, listen, I, I don't disagree with any of it. I wouldn't trade Aaron Rodgers. It seems like he's more comfortable and a little happier than he was this time last year, you know, in the offseason. Like you said, I don't know that this team can get much better, though. Like their cap space, are, are they? can they pay Zadarius? Probably not. No, you and let that's him go. Thing, like, they're not going to get better. How are you going to get better when you don't have any money to spend? And, you know, tagging Devontae Adams is probably not what either side wants to do, but you may have to do it in order to come to a long-term agreement at some point. But you know he's going to want Devontae Adams. If you can't if you can't pay Devontae Adams or if you can't at least tag him for one season, I'm not sure he's going to come back for you anyway. Um, but, yeah, it's it's – He's just so bizarre. It's He's so interesting to talk about because he always gives you – this is the problem. He's giving us the fodder. He does that damn Instagram post, and now everybody's talking about him. And by the way, based on his uh, explanation on Pat McAfee's show, you wouldn't know that he and Shailene Woodley were broken up. Ooh, so, yeah. There's yeah, that. Okay. I mean, he talked about her – like when you find your person, it adds stability in your professional life as well as your personal life. She's a big reason why I've won two straight MVPs. Wait a second. Are you breaking up? Or are you getting married? What's happening? No, they're done. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, we'll watch mystery next week on ET for more. Yeah, exactly. Entertainment. Well, before we supply you with the number of the month, Johnstone yes. Supply in Troy is ready to help you as the frigid winter sets in this month, especially this weekend. So now it's more important than ever to make sure your furnace or boiler is ready to handle the extra workload on the way and coming this weekend. Plus, what happens if your unit breaks down? Make sure you tell your family, friends, and more. The place to call is Johnstown Supply in Troy at 518-272-5922. The crew at Johnstown Supply will give you the advice you need to get out of that dilemma and figure out the best solution for you. If you already know you must make a change this winter, 
Johnstone Supply in Troy has new high-efficient Goodman Furnace and Navian Boilers. Stop into 6th Avenue to learn more. Call Johnstone Supply now at 518-272-5922 and do us a favor, hit 2 for the counter guys and tell Tom, Kevin, James, or Rob that you heard it here on m and m and m with Chris this week. Across the board <laughs> from the Godzilla Media family. You get extra points if you say with Chris this week. Oh, boy. Yeah, then you really know they're locked in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. While, um, while we hose him down, mm -hmm. are we ready for our traditional number of the month? Yeah, hit us with the number. All right, Chris, as we do a hat of the week, we do a number of the month. And this one you're going to have a lot of fun with. I don't think we'll agree on the number one, but I'll make it quick about I've got the top three, but I want to have the three with the asterisk. Okay. okay. I normally rank three, two, one but I have to do the two sets this time. Okay, so let's start this way. You know where it's going. Number three, asterisk, Rafael Palmero. In the most famous denial since Nixon said, I am not a crook, and Clinton said, I did not have a relationship, <laughs> Rafael Palmero stated to Congress, quote, I have never used steroids, period, unquote. The writers disagreed, and he fell off the HOF ballot. He posted 569 dingers and 1,800 ribbies, and at 288. Sorry. Number two, asterisk, Mark McGuire, nearly 600 homers, over 1,400 RBIs, 12-time All-Star, five-time homer leader, a bash brother who later admitted he took steroids. He will have to buy a ticket to Cooperstown. And, of course, he mesmerized the country with Sosa in that famous home run battle that peeved and got a certain guy jealous. Number one, asterisk, Barry Bonds. Uh, photos of the anti neutral system before as a pirate, after as a giant. What's sad is that he didn't have to do this. We know that. He was on a clear path to immortality, but his ego got in the way. He could have played just played baseball, but instead he played Bell Co. instead. 762 homers, nearly 2,000 RBI, and over 5,000 steals, 14 All-Stars, 7 MVP. And now the writers go, let the today's game committee decide. Yeah. Yeah. So here are my three. No asterisk added. Number three, in honor of Sean, of course, Fred Belitnikoff. Mm -hmm. Nearly 9,000 receiving yards, 76 TDs, four time Pro Bowl, won a Super Bowl and an AFL title. He's in both the pro and college football halls of fame. The Raider legend, Sean, that's for you. And I know you would have had him number one. Number two, <laughs> he would have Jim Tomey. 612 homers, nearly 1,700 ribbies. Five-time All-Star, led the National League in homers with the Phillies, and a Baseball Hall of Famer. Here's my number one, Joe Neuendijk. I knew it. You did. Three-time yep. Cup champ. Get this with three mm -hmm. different teams. Yep. Three different teams. He won mm -hmm. the Calder, the King Clancy, got the Conn Smythe. Over 500 goals, over 1,100 points. Got an Olympic gold medal and is a Hockey Hall of Famer. Joe Newendike. So what do you two think for your top three 25s? So I'll go first. I'll give Chris some time to think. Uh, my number three was Bolitnikov. My number two was Newendike. And my number one, because I didn't do a separate asterisk, non-asterisk, was a Bonds-McGuire combo. Listen, mm. my childhood was taken over by the Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire, you know, home run slugging contest each and every day. I teeter back and forth on whether or not they should be in the Hall of Fame. I hope they get put in with some asterisk, you know, by some stupid committee. Um, I don't fault writers for not putting them in, um, but I just think it gets, you know, it gets a little bit hairy when you get guys like Pudge and, and other guys who probably – used, who didn't admit to it, who are in, whatever. Um, but yeah, I put them number one because of the overall body of work. They meant more to baseball during that time than any other baseball players. Uh, and they're all over the record books for it. So they were my number one. I have a honorable mention. My number four just outside is Steve Kerr. I wanted to throw in a basketballer, four titles, Three with the Bulls, one with the Spurs. Listen, he wasn't the best player on the floor, but when you win four titles and you are a very good player, I uh, I wanted to give him a little a little love. Uh, Mark Price was a great twenty-five too. You just oh, had, me, had me thinking there one. too. 
Um, I, I wrote hey, down Cliff, three. I'm sorry. He was my favorite player that yeah. I worked with when we had him with the Warriors, mm. Mark Price. Great okay. call. Awesome yeah. guy. Cool. Um, I wrote down three names just over the course of the show. I didn't do my homework ahead of time, so I apologize. Three names that were not on the list. At least yeah. I didn't see them. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out three names that we haven't discussed yet. I'm Got not it. saying they they are top three in any category. They're just three 25s that I remember uh, fondly. Okay. Um, from my personal fandom, Andrew Jones. Oh, don't know there's yeah. yep. don't know there's been a better, and we can have a war about this if we want. I don't know there's been a better defensive center fielder in the history of baseball. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. Um, Jason Arnott. Wore 25 for the Devils, oh. scored the game-winning goal of the Stanley Cup to beat the Stars. Uh, so I've got 25 when I hear Arnott, or when I think 25, I see Jason Arnott scoring that goal for the New Jersey Devils in, was it 2000, 2001, something like that. Um, and then a, Jim Abbott wore 25, maybe as honorably and valiantly as anybody, obviously through a no-hitter. We know he had only the one hand. Um, so Jim Abbott is another 25. When I hear that number, I think about him often. Love it. Very good, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to throw it. a few uh, that we uh, also want to mention. Of course, Richard Sherman with the Seahawks. Mm -hmm. Vince Carter, great career. Oh, uh, love the Vince. Dave Andrichuk, who I had right on the cusp, too. What a career he had. Yep. And Jacques Lemaire, hats off to him, a longtime Canadian who has his name on the Stanley Cup eight times. Eight times. <laughs> And question for both of you, how about the recent former Sixer who was traded, who wears number 25 as well, who is now a net? Is he the best active 25 if he plays, Mr. Simmons? Oh, boy. Now I, I have to rack say, my brain on I, guess, I can't come up with any other 25s, I guess. But that doesn't say much. That There's was a gotta, great trade. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, he's a, he's a talented, talented player. Um, if he can ever figure out how to shoot the ball. He's working with Corver on that. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you for playing you two on that. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. it was good. Choices. All right. You have to go do, you know, real work and, you know, the other stuff that you do in your life, which is a lot of things. But thanks for coming on. We yeah, this is fun, guys. Thank you. Eric and I are going to do the whiteboard. So, you know, the rest thank you, of Chris. you. Great to see you. And you're doing a great anyway. job on the news. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Thanks, Eric. I appreciate job. that. Thanks. Right, I'll, see you. I'll talk to you later. Okay. See Bye. you. All right, E. Next up, numbers. Or we did the numbers. Next up, whiteboard. Do you want me to go first or you want to go first? You go first. Hey, I got to tell you, you two have a lot in common. It's a shame that you two are married. Oh, wait a minute. You're oh. married already to each yep. other. Okay. You know it. You go ahead. I'm looking forward to this one, too. This could have been a full-on topic, I think, for us. You know how much we love women's sports. Um, this is a monumental win for the U.S. Women's National Team. It has been dragged out over two years now, um, their fight for equal pay, not equitable pay, equal pay, which they more than deserve. And I am not the type of person who will go out and say, hey, WNBA players deserve to make as much as NBA players because it's just not possible. There are certain things where the, the value is not there. This is one of the sports where the value is there and then some because the U.S. women's national team is better than the U.S. men's national team. Yes. They go to the World Cup. They play in significant games. They win significant games. The U.S. women's national team is finally getting what they deserve. Um, they come to a settlement on this lawsuit, $24 million. This was the lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer uh, Federation. 22 of that goes lump sum right to the players. They'll break it up. And then a $2 million uh, sum of that money, the other $2 million, goes into basically an account to benefit post-career goals and charitable efforts for those players. Each player can apply for $50,000 from that fund. Uh, yeah, it's about time. Right, Eric? It's about time. The Again, it's one of the few situations where I would say, like, not only is it possible, it is very necessary that these players make the same amount, especially in bonuses. And this is where it really came down to was like World Cup bonuses were a big issue for this team. Well, like we talked about a few weeks ago, the best sports icon photos. And now you see Brandy Chastain's photo, how much it meant, a yep. turning point photo in sports. But 
I think Megan Rapinoe puts it the best. She says, when we win, everybody wins. And she said, it's a really exciting day. I think we're going to look back on this day and say, this is the moment that U.S. soccer changed for the better. Mm -hmm. The fact there had to be a lawsuit is a disgrace. Yeah. Okay. All these years, all the money spent on it. What's the issue? Why isn't it equal? Why isn't it in the LPGA and PGA Tour? Mm -hmm. Don't use the argument anymore about more people watch the men because you can't buy an ad on ESPN now for the women's basketball tournament. The NCAA tournament has already sold out. So that doesn't wash anymore. So this is about time. This isn't just for Megan and Carly, Alex, Becky, but it's for Mia and all of the people before. And women's soccer is also leads to girls' soccer. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do, Ashley, is go about five miles over here in the fall, and you will see six soccer fields loaded with young ladies who look up to them, who uh, love the game, and have heroes to look up to. So couldn't be happier. Way overdue. Tremendous news. Yeah, listen, I paid, Chris and I paid to see a World Cup semifinal in Montreal for the U.S. women's national wow. team. I would not pay. I mean, listen, first of all, the, the U.S. men's national team would not be in a World Cup semifinal at this point, or I don't think any point in the in the very near future because they're not good enough. Um, and I hope they get good enough. And I hope they are entertaining enough that people around this country want to support them and want to watch them. But right now we're not there. The U.S. women's national team is worth seeing. They're a fun team. They're super talented. And, you know, a judge threw this out, this lawsuit out, the equal pay portion of it, in March. Or they made it in March. A judge threw it out in May of 2020, saying that, quote, you do not need to perform equal work requiring equal skill and effort. Or there is no, there's no like equivalent between the men and women, saying it's not equal skill and effort. It's soccer. There's a, what is the differences between soccer and like how you play soccer on the field? So I'm glad they appealed. I'm glad someone of more sound mind and rational yes. thinking took that on because, yes, they perform exactly the equal amount of skill. They put in all the training sessions, the practice sessions, the weightlifting, the running. It is identical to the amount of work that the men put in. So I'm glad that they are now getting paid what they should be getting paid. Very good topic and very good news. Thank you. All right. I am going to come up with a name that some people may not know about until they listen to this story. His mm -hmm. name is Byron Allen, and he ties into what I said about the NFL yep. recently. Now, you may be asking what harebrained scheme is bouncing around under this hat. Who the heck is Byron Allen? Stand-up comedian at the age of 14, he led Jimmy Walker, remember him, Dynamite, to get him on his writing team with two young, talented comedy writers named Jay Leno and David Letterman. Heard of them. At 18, he was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He now is the head of entertainment studios. He owns 36 TV stations, 12 cable networks. Recently, he just bought the Weather Channel. So now he's the boss who puts Jim Cantore into the hurricanes and tornadoes. Why is he here in today's sports cast? Here's why. Byron Allen could be the next owner of the Denver Broncos. He put in a bid this month. Let me say he should be. I've said there's a lot of talk about the need for more African-American head coaches. I get it. But it's way overdue for an African-American to be an owner of an NFL team. So maybe you could say that the Jacksonville Jaguars are more fitting for a comedian to own. Let's hope that the NFL provides this outstanding business executive the opportunity to own one of its franchises. As Mr. Allen said on CBS Sunday morning, this is everybody's America. Everyone must succeed without exceptions. And yes, that's no joke. Yes, I am 100% behind it. I think the NFL has done a piss poor job of minority representation, um, whether that be African-American, Hispanic, across the board. Um, these are people who deserve to be represented by a league that is heavily made up of black players. Like they, they should see you know, these positions at the top should be run by people who look like them. Um, and Byron Allen is more than deserving. So let's get a black owner. Let's, let's not have it be the first or the not, it's going to be the first, let's not have it be the last, right? Like let's have this become a commonplace thing where we don't have to talk about it anymore because it becomes the norm. Let's freaking do it. Yes, Eric. I remember him as a young comedian. I, was I, I was going to say, I don't remember him as a comedian, but 
good for him. Like way to work your way up in the world. You know what I mean? Like way to just, whoo, good for that yeah. guy. I, I'm really happy with our whiteboards this week because we're celebrating things that yes. should have occurred years and years ago. Yep. I know. Isn't it crazy that you feel like you're still talking about stuff like this? And it's like, did, wasn't this supposed to be like a long time ago? What is what is taking so long? Um, Eric, I just because your uh, book kind of touches on or your um, sorry, your whiteboard touches on this. I just finished a book. It's called I Came as a Shadow and it's the autobiography of John Thompson. And you want to talk about a black coach who changed not only the game of basketball, but he changed young basketball players' lives, white and black. Um, he did so much for so many people. Um, the book is fantastic, but it's about John Thompson growing up in Washington in a world, listen, he grew up in a white world. And yeah. his his view of being a young black man in what was otherwise a white world, it's fascinating stuff. It's fascinating. Um, but yeah, did so much good. His, his impact, he passed away uh, a few years ago now. His impact will be felt in the game forever, but also in life forever. He talks about his relationship with Phil Knight of Nike. Um, it It's super fascinating stuff. If you're looking for a good read, I came as a shadow, John Thompson. Listen, I hate Georgetown because I'm a Syracuse fan. You're more Syracuse. Than anyone. Yeah, that's right. I appreciate the heck out of not his own, not only his coaching, but just his, the life that he led. He was super brave, did a lot of awesome stuff uh, off the court that he was probably more proud of. He would tell you he's more proud of than the stuff he did on the court. So, Well, Byron Allen would like, uh, or John Thompson would like what he had on the quote on the CBS when he was interviewed. And he said, with all these uh, things happening, you sound like a great white shark. And he said, I'm a great black shark. Heck and he yeah. had a big smile. So I love it. Thank awesome. you so much for getting Chris to join us today. Yeah, I'll, I'll send him a big heart text in a little bit when I talk to him. But yeah, this has been fun. We'll see you next week. M and M and M across the board. We had M M and O this week. We'll be back. M and M and M across the board. Apple, YouTube, Spotify, Twitter at M M M A T B one. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Take care. <laughs>